reforms. And you can see here we're starting on chapter 12. Um, there's going to be a whole lot of different reform movements we're going to go into, but for a second, um, this video is really more about um, some of the morality behind these reforms. So the thing is, when we're looking at morality and reforms, you have to talk about the benevolent empire. This is an idea that was put forward that was basically calling to restore moral order. With all of these changes going on across the United States, people were concerned about the morality being lost, um, but didn't necessarily want to like institutionalize religion within the politics. So um, people were concerned about things like the increasing number of the urban per poor. Um, and so because of that, you get like wealthy merchants would contribute to like the financial support of all kinds of networks of reform associations. And a lot of these reform societies were actually built on second great awakening techniques of like organization and communication. A lot of times they would have a goal, sink, um, basically linking up social and moral discipline. And the idea was that this appealed to both churchgoers who were concerned with, you know, godlessness, but it also appealed to like profit oriented businessmen because they were really eager to curb their workers unruly behavior. Now, sometimes these reform movements took it a little too far. Um, especially with the idea of institutionalizing some specific type of religion. Um, a great example of this was the Sabbatarian movement. The Sabbatarian movement um, eventually is seen as basically the Sabbath purists having gone too far because uh, they're going to lobby, for instance, to end the delivery of mail on Sundays. Um, but Congress is actually going to end up upholding the Postal Law of 810 that would have um, directed post offices to continue delivering mail on Sunday. Basically, uh, this particular movement was seen as a threat to like civil liberties and the rights of private property because it seemed like it was going too far in saying that like post office workers couldn't deliver mail on Sundays. Um, now you might be going, wait a second, we don't get mail on Sundays. That actually doesn't go into effect in the United States until 1912. Then you have the temperance movement. Really, this is one of the largest reforms of this time. The drive against the consumption of alcohol, uh, many people argue is going to have the greatest impact on the most amount of people than any reform movement. This is kind of arguable considering we're going to later get into like abolitionism and other kinds of reform ideas. But um, this reform movement is really big and it does change the United States permanently. And I'll give you some personal examples um, after I kind of talk about the temperance movement at this time. Um, it really rested on the persuasion of a voluntary decision of individuals to free themselves from sin, which would be drinking alcohol. So you get things like the American Temperance Society emerging. Um, this is a national organization that is made in 1826. It was very much made by evangelical Protestants. So you're seeing how religion is intertwining in this reform movement. And they're gonna campaign for that total abstinence from alcohol. And the thing is they are gonna be really successful in sharply lowering the per capita consumption of alcohol. In fact, if you look at 1830, so when they start doing this work really, America was consuming about three times as much alcohol as America consumed in the early 2000s. Taverns outnumbered churches during that time period. Thus, once again, you see religion coming into it. Alcohol could be used to pay common laborers. Sharing a drink was very much a customary way of taking a break from work. Today, Generally, they frown on you taking a break from work and having a drink. Um, no meeting in that time period was complete without alcohol. But for temperance to work, basically people needed to energize like thousands of people to make it just actually give up alcohol. 
And so evangelical reformers are going to denounce intemperance as like the greatest sin of the land. And they'll say, you know, alcohol represents everything that is wrong with America. And you see this message of temperance in the pulpit of church, but also the public lectern. It's printed in the presses. And you get these like emotionally charged sermons with large tearful prayer meetings that would invoke guilt among sinners who, of course, want a release from this guilt. And thus they would have a pledge of abstinence. Uh, women in particular are going to get involved and pressure their husbands and businessmen are going to welcome temperance because they saw it as then their workers would be more productive and less prone to, you know, like accidents and everything. Um, before I go into more detail, though, about that time period and some reforms, I do want to talk about um, how this affects us all the way to today. So first of all, lowering how much alcohol is consumed. That's a really big one. But a lot of it's things like um, we define alcoholism differently today, partly because of temperance. Um, so I can talk about alcoholism a lot because both of my grandparents were actually high functioning alcoholics. Um, that means that my grandfather was able to hold down a job um, until retirement, everything like that. And then at the end of the day, um, he could go home and he drank a lot and he depended on that. And my grandmother was very much the same way. Um, the thing is, in America, they're considered high functioning alcoholics or they were. They died when I was like six. But... In England today, and I can talk about this a lot too because I lived in England, they define alcoholism much differently. If my grandparents lived in England today and acted the same way that they had when they were alive, they would not be considered alcoholics. And a lot of this is because as long as you are functioning in society and not hurting anyone, the idea is that you're not an alcoholic. And so Part of the reason for this is, A, England doesn't have the same car culture as America does. Uh, things are a lot closer together and there's just a lot more um, bus networks and everything like that. And so there's not as much of a concern of drinking and driving as there is in America. Um, but a lot of it's because of things like temperance that we see this change happen in America of what is considered acceptable drinking habits and what isn't. And you have to keep in mind that, you know, when we were looking at all these different areas, it's something like up to 40% of the population in certain areas were of English descent. And then if you include like Irish descent as well, that makes up a bit lot of population. And so you can see how this link between drinking and background kind of splits here and really splits away from a lot of that, um, European view of drinking versus American view of drinking today. Then we have to look at women's role in reform. Now, this is once again looking at temperance in this picture, but the thing is women are going to go on to do so much more than just push for temperance. They are going to found their own maternal associations. A lot of times it starts with temperance um, by like praying and fasting for, you know, the moral strength to save the souls of children. Um, and sometimes even like sponsoring revivals. And so it'd be things like visiting the poor um, and a lot of times establishing like Sunday schools and distributing Bibles and religious tracts. Um, and a lot of times it's about like going out and talking about temperance in that mor moral and religious ideology. The thing is, this is really widening women's public role. But on the other hand, it's reinforcing cultural stereotypes of women as, oh, yes, it's okay for them to talk about this because it's just them being a nurturing helpmate who still defers to men. However, we are going to see that women, when involved in reform, are going to start challenging some male prerogatives and kind of move beyond just the moral persuasion. So it's things like a great example of this is the crusade against uh, prostitution. Women would go out and identify that it was male greed and graliciousness that really are the causes for the fallen state of these women. They would openly um, 
identify male patrons of cities brothels trying to you know shame them in their role um blame businessmen for the low wages that forced a lot of women to resort to prostitution and would even attack male employers for exploiting the poor i mean you look at this image here and even when they're doing this that's temperance and that's considered reform i mean you have women brandishing axes which would not be considered part of a stereotypical woman's role at this time Partly because of this and partly because of other reasons, we are going to see some backlash against this morality of reform. Men would attack feminized evangelicalism because they felt like it was undermining their paternal authority. Um, one of the most enduring religious backlashes of this time period is actually the establishment of the Mormon church. Um, at that time period, uh, they would in that church assign like the complete spiritual and secular authority only to men whereas women could only hope to gain you know salvation through subordination and obedience to their husbands um this was actually considered the most successful alternative vision in antebellum america 